This week on the Hollywood in Toto podcast, we warn conservatives why their culture war efforts might be wasted if they don't fix this one problem and fix it soon. We talk with Kayvon, a very funny comedian who found out the hard way that college students, well, they can't take a joke. And we share why Saturday Night Live might actually speak truth to power this season. Really? Well, maybe. Welcome to the Hollywood and Toto podcast. Entertainment news and reviews without the woke Hollywood narrative. Free speech, free expression. Now that's entertainment. And here's your host, award-winning film critic, Christian Toto. Before we start, I'd love it if you'd subscribe to the Hollywood and Toto podcast on your favorite audio platform. We've got new episodes every Wednesday, plus lots of bonus episodes coming your way soon. Subscribe now and you won't miss episodes with John Nolte, Kurt Schlichter, and Mr. Ripaverse himself, Eric July. I caused a bit of a kerfuffle earlier this week. I just love using that word. Plus, it's true. I wrote a column at HollywoodandToto.com that was chastising my fellow conservatives They're not doing all they can to promote right-leaning art. Ah, yes, listen, everyone has written about Sound of Freedom and that Oliver Anthony guy. I get that. Those are the exceptions. Mostly when conservatives make art, they do a terrible job of promoting that art. Meanwhile, liberal media just goes out of its way to promote, support, and protect anything remotely progressive in the stories. Why can't conservatives do the same? Well, competitive envy is partly to blame. And I think you know what I mean. But there's more here. You know, the right still doesn't get why pop culture matters. Still. They would also understand that the people who are defying the industry group thing to create right-leaning art, they deserve support. Absolutely. They're sticking their necks out. The great actor Robert Davi said just that. He waited on the subject via the Pop Culture Warriors podcast, which, by the way, is new and I highly recommend it. Davi looked back at his film from last year, My Son Hunter. He directed it. He does direct from time to time. Um, You know, he's mainly an actor, but he has a lot of different talents. He's also a great singer, by the way. And the film was really prescient about, of course, the first son, Hunter Biden. Not a lot of conservative outlets gave it much attention. There was a story here or there, sure, but they could have went wall to wall with their coverage. They could have really gone out of their way to say, hey, this is a story that Hollywood would never tell. And here it is. And one of her own directed it. This is important. Let's get it out there. Maybe it'll change some hearts and minds. That's what a great story can do. Well, what Davi learned is that there weren't a lot of conservative outlets ready to give it their undivided support or even their attention. It's all there dramatized. So you would think, hey, guys, watch this film because it, it, it has a different effect. Culture has a, has a more lasting effect than a blurb on something and also celebrate your artists Mm -hmm. that are courageous enough to do something. Yeah. Yeah. Celebrate, lift us up. If it was Alec Baldwin doing something on Trump, you bet your ass the left would be piping that out every single day. He's right. But I mean, listen, I don't argue with one of Hollywood's toughest tough guys. So I don't think even if I disagreed, I wouldn't say it, but he is right. Now, there may be a bit of a silver lining to my tough love column and the stir it created online, not just because I got a lot of nice comments from people who had read it, but I can't say much more about what I'm referring to, but I did have a conversation just a few days ago, and it made me just absolutely filled with hope. I think there's some promise here, but I can't say more about it, at least not right now. But you know, as soon as I can say something... You'll hear about it here, first. I'll say it. We need more comedians like Kayvon. The PG-rated comic is flat-out funny. That's what matters, of course. Let's just start there. (laughs) Then you can go on these low-budget airlines, okay? Spirit Airlines. I think they get their flight attendants directly from the prison work release program. I don't know if you, one time I got on a spirit flight and already the flight attendant, say it again, say it again. How dare you say it again? 
I'm like, I hope he doesn't say it again. I didn't even know what it was. I just, don't say it, don't say it, sir. And she was talking to the pilot. It's tension on there. If you don't know Spirit Airlines, they're great. The flight is $9. But here's how they get you. Go to check a bag or two, 300 extra dollars. But he's also willing to enter the lion's den. And I mean the modern day college campus. To teach students that it's okay to laugh at jokes. I think mean, I mean, they may need a few more lessons in that regard, but good for, good for Kayvon for going in and trying it out. He's also a whiz at social media. He's got a lot of different platforms. He's leveraging all those different accounts to, of course, promote his work. He's an entrepreneur, but also make us laugh. That matters. He recently teamed with Valuetainment, a newer company that's trying to spread jokes, spread the message, and also some right-leaning beliefs about freedom, free speech, across the digital arena. I am all for it, and Kayvon's the perfect guy to do just that. He shares more about the new partnership in our conversation coming up. He also has, I would think, the cutest boxer you've ever seen. The dog's name is Reno, and you can fact-check me by visiting Kayvon's Instagram page. That's at Kayvon Comedy. Kayvon has been dipping a few toes in the culture wars, for sure, but he does it with a smile and a great sense of humor. More, please. Here's my chat with Reno's dad, Kayvon. Kayvon, welcome back to the show. Now, you walk a fine and a unique line in comedy because you're right of center. You often lean that way in your work. But at the same time, I would imagine when you're on stage, you're more of a general audience entertainer. You don't get as political as you do on social media and the podcast. So t- talk about that approach. And has that been hard to navigate? Because it, it, it could be complicated, it sounds like. Well, yeah, uh, not really too hard to comp- to do because the reason is I did cruise ships and colleges and I'm used to a wide range of audience. Mm-hmm. So I don't mind um, entertaining everyone. And then when I do my podcast or something online, I feel like they're coming to my world. So they know what to expect and they can easily hit the, the, the arrow mm-hmm. or click the X button. <laughs> but when you're at a live show, even if um, my best fan in the world is there, he might have brought his wife or his girlfriend or grandma, and I'm there to kind of make a meal that kind of is more generally well accepted. Yeah. So I'm just there to make everybody laugh. Excellent. And as far as making people laugh these days, are there any particular subjects that are really, I mean, obviously your jokes are always funny, but is there one particular content type or just subject that's really clicking with audiences lately? You know, I really have been enjoying making fun of Joe Biden (laughs) and falling up and down the stairs and off the bike and getting on the bike. But then I turn it and go, but, you know, we can also talk about Trump and you can watch the whole room kind of come together and their eyes light up. Uh And truth be told, I actually am complimenting Trump as I'm teasing him (laughs) while still making fun of Joe Biden. But uh, to the untrained ear, it sounds like, yeah, you got both of them. Good job. Yeah, yeah, the, the balance is important. And I think, you know, I think at the end of the day, if the jokes aren't mean spirited, it definitely has a different attitude toward them. I think that's one of the reasons why Alec Baldwin was so disappointing to me when he was on SNL as Trump is that you, you knew his angle, you knew his anger, you knew what he was trying to do. And it just wasn't as funny because he's a very talented guy and he can make us laugh, but it didn't quite so get So true. No, yeah. Dana Carvey had a love for George Bush. You could see it in the impression mm-hmm. to the point George Bush invited him to the <laughs> White House to do it for him. And with uh, the problem with Alec uh, Baldwin is you could see that it was hatred in his lips and his eyes. Now, I do a great Trump impression. And mm-hmm. I, I, I talk about how, you know, we had a Chinese spy balloon under Biden that got all the way to Montana before we even started noticing it. And they didn't shoot it down till South Carolina. I said, if that was Trump, as soon as they left Beijing, he, he'd come right out. I've just been told there's a great big balloon coming from China of all places. We've really got to do something. If we don't, next Mexico will send a spy pinata. These things are coming. I know what's going to happen. And the crowd is dying laughing because you could almost picture the guy saying it. But that's what I was just talking about. There's still love behind the impression because by the end of it, we have a little mini Trump rally where everyone's laughing. We don't want the spy pinatas because when you break them open, Candy does not come out, Christian. More Mexicans will. Believe me, folks. <laughs> it can be done. You can tell funny Trump jokes. You know, it was funny that, uh, oh gosh, it was Conan O'Brien was complaining that, oh yeah, Trump ruined comedy and it was hard to do jokes. No, no, it's not. It's not. Use plenty of ways to 
approach him in a no. way that's different and unique. But uh, you no, know, he didn't ruin comedy. Guys like Hassan Minhaj are ruining comedy, but we can get into that later. Yeah, well, let's get into it right now. You know, he came out recently. <laughs> at least it was an expose. I believe it was New Yorker magazine that said a lot of the stories he's been telling just aren't true. Now. You're a comedian. You know you exaggerate. Mm-hmm. You blow things up. Uh, you know, yes. I've heard comedians say, you know, my wife left recently for the purposes of this joke. I mean, there's that <laughs> creative freedom. But what he did is different. So I, I am curious about your reaction to what he did because he was telling these stories that had a very specific goal. And it wasn't just comedy. There was something else there. So what's your take? Yeah, he's doing activism speech. He's not really pitching it as comedy. There's no joke there. When you say, uh, this girl I asked to a homecoming said no because you're a brown Muslim. Well, guess what, B.I., you know, Mm -hmm. I'm here now. You're racist and I'm a millionaire. Well, and then he shows a picture of the girl behind him. That's not a joke. And there's a real victim behind that. And so what the left does and what this kind of thing is, it's just like Jussie Smollett's. This is Muzzy Smollett's. The Muslim (laughs) Indian guy is going to tell you how hard his life was. And I hate that The View and Whoopi Goldberg and other comedians are like, we all exaggerate jokes. What is wrong with some people? That's not our argument, and you just nailed it. I'll exaggerate a joke. If I say I had the worst date with the girl the other night, let me tell you what happened. I don't name her. I don't show her on the screen. Mm -hmm. And it's actually like three or four bad dates rolled into one just for comedic purposes. Yeah, I exaggerated, but all these things kind of happen, and it ends in a punchline. His were like, yeah, because of white racist in America – this is that activism comedy I'm telling you about that they sent a white powder to my daughter and I opened it and it poured on my baby's head and we had to rush to the hospital. You can't kill me. I'm going to keep using my voice. Mic drop that. Do you hear any comedy? Is there any punchline? Is there any laugh? So these things are not OK. And it is a violation of comedy. I think it's right up there with stealing jokes word for word from another comedian mm-hmm. is pretending that racism happened because it's just another form of of the Jesse Smollett situation where you're trying to you're trying to find racism that isn't there and when you get caught say well other people are dealing with it so I'm just trying to be emotionally true. Ah, yeah, the emotional truth line. <laughs> I'm surprised that he that even tried that out but I guess they did nothing else there. You know, you look mm-hmm. at comedy these days dry bar comedy you've been a part of that obviously podcasts every other comedian has a as a as a podcast it's a great format for them stand up stages you you're seeing youtube there's a lot of comedians have these uh, specials they're skipping hbo they're skipping netflix is going right to youtube it, it yep. feels like a golden age you know i, I remember the 80s where there, every different comedian had a sitcom and it was another kind of a gold rush in a sense and i feel like there's something similar happening now why do you think that is why, why from a cultural perspective why do you think we're we're so enamored with comedy it just seems like everywhere every, everyone's interested in it well something great happened is that instagram youtube offers shorts tiktok offers under 1 minute content and it allowed comedians that were normally repressed uh, you know, because there was like curated, it was like the powers that be would choose which comedian could get on. So good if you're Jerry Seinfeld, great if you're George Wallace, but the rest of these great, these guys just sat on the bench. Mm-hmm. Well, now there is no bench. Whoever comes to the table with a joke and the first to market with a joke, for instance, uh, there was a hurricane that came to San Diego called Hurricane Hillary. And I happened to be in San Diego that night performing. And I said, don't worry, I'm not scared of Hurricane Hillary. You know, we all know Hillary doesn't blow that hard. <laughs> Uh, if it was Hurricane Monica, we'd have to run for cover. <laughs> and I uploaded it and got like 100,000 views that weekend because I was so timely with yep. it. Now, that joke will never work two years from now in a special. Remember that hurricane back in 2023? <laughs> no. So it, it, that's why things can be topical. They can be instant and mm-hmm. easily shareable yeah. on these uh, social media channels. And people are finding their own favorite comics, whether uh, The Tonight Show you know, sanctions it or not. Sure. And the cream rises to the top. If it's funny, that's the bottom line. You'll share it. And it doesn't matter what the source is or whether this comedian is cool or hip or, or approved of, by the way. You know, I actually want to, I want to ask you this later, but let's get into it right now. There have been comedians who have been censored, whose their work has been punished or demonetized or you name it. You, you know, you're a pretty clean comedian. You don't really work blue, but you often will push into areas that maybe are a little bit edgy at times. Has that been an issue for you? Have you had, have you struggled with censorship or any kind of, monkey business when it comes to uh, social media? I think in the 50s or 60s, maybe the conservatives might censor you. Hey, we don't talk like that and we don't dance with girls you know, <laughs> in the hall. 
But now the far left is doing all the censoring. So we don't joke about trans issues and we don't talk about LGBTQIA. So that's where it's coming from now. So I'm a clean comic and I don't use a lot of foul language and I don't even get that into it. But my words and my ideas are being told these are not acceptable topics to joke about. Mm -hmm. And so that's what's getting frustrating because I'm like, here I am being like vanilla ice cream Boy Scout. You know, all my peers are like doing jokes about stuff that you couldn't say in front of my grandma without blushing. <laughs> and I've had two dry bar comedy specials. Dry bar, you can't just be clean. They say you have to be Provo clean. So it sounds like a, that sounds like a product for your shirt. You got your shirt <laughs> Provo clean. <laughs> and, um, and so that's, that's what's so weird to me. Maybe you can help explain it to me, but here I am trying to be Provo clean and doing these two specials, 40 minutes of material. And these college students are telling their administrators, don't let him come to our school here. We don't feel safe as if I'm going to run around and just attack people. I'm just there to tell 45 minutes of jokes and go home, kids. Yeah. Well, you know, the movie that from 2019 was No Safe Spaces with Adam Carolla and Dennis Prager. And they yes. they warned us. They warned us what was coming. And it's here now. Uh, you also kind of go in the belly of the beast with TPUSA. You've been touring and, and kind of introducing comedy to the <laughs> to the way to the wild, <laughs> a.k.a. Comedy. They forced me into that. <laughs> yeah. I, OK, so I had a show at Auburn. Three gay students protested straight to the dean. They shut down the show for 300 students that wanted to see a show. Then I had a show in Plattsburgh. The biggest university system in the United States is the SUNY system, State University of New York. And they shut down my show because, you know, four trans students and a three gay, two lesbian and a partridge in a pear tree showed up. And there goes a show for 200 students up in Plattsburgh. So I didn't want to join TPUSA. When I do jokes at Turning Point, I go... It's kind of like I got put in prison and I had to join the skinheads. Well, that's who you guys are. And they're all wearing khaki pants and polo shirts looking like, we're the skinheads? Cool. The counterculture is really well dressed these days. So this happened twice yeah. to you. It's happened, it's happened multiple times, uh, but two that were like blatant in my face, like we're canceling you because of them. Mm-hmm. And and the kids love that. A lot of the radical left, they can't build anything on their own. They can't do a comedy career like me for 16 years. I post a new video every Monday because Mondays usually suck and we want to bring laughter to the world on Monday. They can't do that. But what they can do is get 10 together and stop a comedy show or stop a Dennis Prager or stop a Larry Elder from speaking. Gosh, if you could go back to the 1960s and think the the free speech movement was alive and well on college campuses, and then we're in 2023 and this is what's happening. It is very frightening. Do you see anything yeah, changing for the better? I mean, you, you know, you, you could say, oh, these are isolated incidents, and and well, they shouldn't happen. Obviously, maybe it's it's not this way all over. But what what's your sense as a comedian, or is it or is it just the worst at the college level? Well, what's funny is I've always just been a truth teller. I try to tell truth through comedy. So unlike Hassan, he says, I try to do 70% truth, 30% lie. I found a joke hits harder if it's 95% truth and 5% punchline at the end. And so um, I think the pendulum is swinging back now. I see I see more people. Bill Burr speaks up. Then you got a couple, you know, handful of other people going, what's with this cancel culture? But the thing is, it sounds a little fake because they didn't really come out when it was really hot. Now it's kind of like, looks like the coast is getting a little more clear. We're going to mm-hmm. come say our two cents. And I think... Adam Carolla and myself and even Jim Brewer, uh, you know, one of the first, and he didn't have to do this. Uh, Adam, uh, oh, geez, what's his name? He's Filipino. <laughs> oh, Joe Coy? Rob Schneider. Oh, Rob sorry. Schneider. Why did that name? <laughs> Rob Schneider has this great career with Adam Sandler, but he was one of the first big names to be like, this is ridiculous. We can't do this. Mm-hmm. And I love to Rob Schneider forever for doing that. Cause he kind of, I, I think he's saying what Adam Sandler's not allowed to say. That's why he keeps getting in movies. <laughs> um, <laughs> Cause there's no reason why he should be, still have a career at all based on what he said against the left with the masks, the Fauci, the LGB, the lockdowns. So he's been a guiding light too. Yeah. And uh, it, it'll be interesting to see what his career is like in the next two or three years, because I think that how, I mean, he's been just spouting off in, in a wonderful way on social media, saying all the things you can say. So that, that makes things complicated. Uh, you know, he what, said something great, but, but I just want to say, he yeah. said, um, he said, yeah, this might affect my work, but I just want my kids to grow up in a, in a world worth living in. Mm-hmm. That's why I'm using my voice for this. And I thought that was really, really important. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and God bless him for saying that. By the way, I, I spoke to Mike Binder a few weeks ago in the show, and he's talked about some of the biggest pushback he gets 
about his comedy, about his interests, about his voice is from fellow comedians that, that, you know, Mm -hmm. we we mentioned the the students have been rough on you at times and it's crazy to even say that. Have you found some pushback from fellow comedians who, who disagree with you or try to, I I don't even, I don't even know if they're trying to punish you or just belittle you or just mock you or anything. What, what have you found? Absolutely. They're very vindictive. Comedy is a team sport the way, you know, wrestling is or boxing or swimming. Like they still want to win and Mm -hmm. they want to be number one. And, and a lot of comedians have no work and they have nothing going on. So they figure, Hey, if I can out like a conservative comedian, or I say, Hey, I think your joke is racist. Then if enough people see me, I've virtue signaled enough. Maybe I'll get offered a part or a role in a Mm -hmm. movie. And it doesn't ever work like that. So I have gotten a lot of like at the, and it's always the lower level guys that are the loudest because they're trying to get the attention of, you know, they have nothing going on. They're just on Facebook saying, I'm offended. I'm offended. And when I got into comedy, I thought it was a gang of pirates that all didn't give a, you know what, and we're going to go on the black pearl and sail the seven seas matey. And no, a lot of them just want to be indoor cats, just pet by Netflix and you, you know, executives from comedy central and so forth. Yeah. I think that's why Adam Carolla created his pirate ship because he knew, he knew it was coming and he did, he needed a vessel to sell, sail through all the, the troubled waters. And that's what I, that's what I did. I, I joined TP USA. So thank you, Charlie Kirk for building a platform where I can still do my college gigs, which mm-hmm. I love. And the people who come are so open-minded and, and conservative. And you know what I do? I also invite the community to come. So we have adults sitting in the room and all the purple hair, <laughs> lip ring kids that come protest. They see too many adults. They go, I don't want to mess with these silverback gorillas. I don't know who these guys are. <laughs> they could be the dean, firemen, police. I don't know what's going on. So I'll just sit quiet and watch. Uh, and then I joined Valuetainment. Mm-hmm. And that's another. So I'm building firewall after firewall in my real life. And tell me about Valuetainment because I, I want to... You mentioned some of the celebrities you met recently, but talk about that company, what their mission is, and and why it's a, such a perfect fit for you. Well, first of all, Patrick Bet David started Valuetainment. He is this uh, business mogul entrepreneur, and he's Persian, and my dad is Persian too. He's multicultural, uh, but he I watch him on a bunch of videos. I go, dude, I love what you're saying. He was interviewing celebrities. He had a great sense of humor, and at one point he goes, Donald Trump. And Barack Obama, I will pay you each $1 million to a charity of your choice if you just come have a conversation with me for one hour. Mm -hmm. And neither one responded to him. (laughs) But that's when I realized that's the kind of guy I want to work for. Yeah, yeah. Because he isn't just trying to be divisive. He wants to have the full conversation. He'll still have his point of view. But we're not scared. That's the thing on the right. We want to have the crazy leftist talk and the drag queen, you know, spanking the Burbank mayor. We're going to have an opinion on it. But we're not going to say, you know, say this is how we like to live our life. No, we're going to make fun of it and try to stop it for future generations. But they want to stop even the ability to have that platform. So uh, Valuetainment was so cool. They, they invited me after four years of kind of back and forth mm-hmm. saying, do we need a comedy division? I think we do. Yeah. They brought me in and now I'm making comedy sketches, a comedy talk show, which kind of rivals the Daily Show or the Weekend Update that mm-hmm. SNL does. And we just pick up all the jokes they're refusing to do. And there's plenty of meat on that bone. Oh, my gosh. This, you, may, you may never get any sleep <laughs> at this point. But uh, you also uh, told me you met Tom Brady and Mike Tyson, uh, two superstars in their individual sports. Any interesting stories about those conversations or those meetings? Because I can't imagine meeting well, people like that. They're just so off the charts. Yes. Value team hires me and they go, your first day of work is at the vault, our big business conference. I go, what's that? I show up 3,000 people spending anywhere from $10,000 all the way down to $1,000 for a full weekend of just business, motivational speaking, skills, development, that kind of thing. And uh, and the first day of work, there's Tom Brady. <laughs> and uh, he's given a speech on how he became the most winningest quarterback in football history. And then I get a text, you are one of the 85 people selected to meet Tom, which I think they just threw me the bone because I just started. Sure. Because not everyone got this. And Tom has in his contract, only 85 people can say something to him and click the camera. And his agent is right there with the clicker. Click, <laughs> click, click, 85, we're done. So if you went cross-eyed or blinked, you don't get another picture. Sorry, buddy. <laughs> That's amazing. So the funny thing, I'm meeting Tom Brady. He's tall, and I he's wearing the same blue button-down shirt I have. It looks similar, at least. I go, Tom, are we wearing the same shirt? <laughs> this is what I use my talk. And he's like, I, I guess so. I go, that means you shop at H&M also. <laughs> and everyone laughed in the room. They go, that's it. That's enough talking. That was two. That was two. Get out of here. So that was cool. Then the next day of work, they bring in Mike Tyson to speak to the same group. 
And uh, I've met Mike Tyson before. And when I went to take a picture with him, I flexed my arm like a like a punch, like like I'm a fighter, too, which I'm not. Oh, my. And uh, as soon as I put my arm near, he kind of has shifty eyes. So he doesn't quite trust. He grew up, you know, pretty rough life. And yeah. Yeah. Now he's friendly. He's an indoor cat now, but he's still got those. <laughs> so I thought of a sketch, which we didn't film. But what if as I lifted my fist, the flash sent him back to like 1984 Oof. when his biggest highlight moments. And then he took a swing, you know, so <laughs> that would have been good if I got knocked out by Mike Tyson. I oh would've, my. That would have been something for the record books. But if you survive, the third you go viral. Work, <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. So in my stand up act, I now ask men, hey, what would be the dollar amount that you would take one punch from Mike Tyson? Who would do it for a thousand? <sighs> in 10,000 and you see some people going up to a million and some people go I nah because I wouldn't live so I don't want the punch I can't, and then the third day of work was Larry go ahead go ahead no I, was, I can't even imagine a, a money a monetary amount I can, can't even imagine being in front of one of those haymakers that's unacceptable exactly no no I don't think our necks are built for it Christian that's right you said Larry Elder was another person <laughs> but, you met uh, along the way well, yes. And then the third day of work, Larry Elder. Now, these are all people I've really watched, admired, or respected over the years. So that's how I knew I was at the right company. Mm -hmm. And Candace Owens came a week later. And, you know, the, the names go forever. So I'm just so happy to be here. I'm going to do my best not to get fired and keep making funny content. But now that Valuetainment is filming my podcast, it's like I leveled up. The cameras are better. The sound is better. The production is better. So I hope people will check out my YouTube channel yeah, from here on out. Absolutely. And before we let you go, you strike me as someone who is not only just very funny, but also ambitious. You've made this new entertainment uh, collaboration. What are you looking for as, you know, maybe even just thinking about 2024, uh, expanding your empire? What's what's on tap for you or what can you tease about what you've got planned? Well, we want to do lots of sketches that are like topical. We mm -hmm. want to do the podcast, keep it going, build it up. I have 430,000 subscribers on YouTube. We want to have a million by this time next year because everyone's going to be talking about the topics. This is not the season. We're getting ahead of the ball. And then I want to do man on the street. I'm going to call it cave on the street. <laughs> and we're going to go around and ask people t questions anywhere from serious to silly about, you know, who you're voting for. Can you spell Kamala? <laughs> you know, can you describe John Fetterman? Whatever it is. And we're going to get some real reactions from real people so that everyone can be a part of what we're doing. I love it. And I love the fact you're willing to cross over the aisle, entertain everyone and have those conversations. I think more and more people like that. And by the way, I give Bill Maher a lot of credit because I think he's been much more uh, inclusive in his commentary, in his guests, in his, his patter, because I think for a while he was very hard nosed and very very one-sided. And I think that we need more people like Bill Maher, more people like you, Kayvon, who, who just want to be funny and, and don't discriminate and want to just make everyone laugh. And it's weird to even have that conversation, well, but that's now an endangered species. It is. And Bill woke up because at first it was just left, right versus left, but the left kept eating their own and went after white men who are over the age of 60. And now you're treading in Bill Maher's territory. <laughs> so he had to quickly do what I did. He had to kind of straddle the fence a little and go, Hey, help me in case they come after my ankle, guys. Yeah. I go, yeah, yeah, Bill. Of course. Now you're here. Yeah. Hey, listen, <laughs> by any red pill necessary, I don't mind. But uh, Kayvon, thank you so That's much right. for joining the show. You can see Kayvon Live September 29th and the 30th in Ashburn, Virginia, or later, yeah. October 26th through the 29th in Edmonton. And he's got even more dates, November 2nd in Hobart, Indiana, and the 3rd in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Just go to KayvonComedy.com. That's k hyphen von Comedy. Dot com for all the details. Yes. And of course, check out and the you know what, Christian, show. Yeah. Well, I'm going to do this. I want to give your listener the first 20 people that find me on Instagram or on my website and DM me. They're the first 20 will get a free ticket to come check out one of those shows you just mentioned. Outstanding. I mean, I'd, I'd pay, but hey, that's great. I really appreciate the offer. <laughs> and of course, the the right Absolutely. show with Kayvon, new cameras, new equipment, new everything. Just check it out on yes. your favorite podcast platform or of course on YouTube as well to get the full experience. Kayvon, uh, we've kind of connected for a while. Really appreciate you checking out the show and being a guest. And of course, give all our love to your, your boxer because uh, your dog's a cutie pie. Yes. We have a mutual love of boxers. And by the way, Christian, I love your writing because whenever I see it, it's just done really well. And, and you cut to the chase and you really explain things. So everyone keep following. Oh, thanks so much. Take care, Kayvon, and we'll talk soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. The writer's strike is over. The writer's strike is over. And that means Saturday Night Live will be coming back sooner than later.
I, I get it. The show is a shadow of its old self. It's just another propaganda outlet for the Democrats. And listen, my liberal listeners, you know I'm right. You know it's true. And you also know that betrays the show's legacy. This show once hit both sides hard. It was funny. It was cutting. It was memorable. But now... Oh, gosh, I can't. I, I, I wake up in a cold sweat thinking that Alec Baldwin might come back to the show and do more Trump. It was just awful, just so predictable. Ah, terrible. But this season, early in this season, I think there's a chance for a, a, a different approach from the new not-so-improved Saturday Night Live. Here's two reasons why I'm thinking this way. First of all, President Biden's decline is impossible to hide. You just can't. It's sad. But it's the state of the nation. Now, the press is actually starting to report on it gingerly, gently. Oh, and by the way, the White House aides are trying to make sure that President Biden doesn't trip. They've changed him from shoes to sneakers. I mean, these are amazing news stories, but they're just told in a very matter-of-fact way, and the press marches on. Now, they should have been saying this months and months ago. It's almost like there's a bias in the news coverage, but that, that can't be. But more importantly, the press is starting to report all these things about Biden now as the election cycle starts to heat up. And that suggests, and this sounds conspiratorial, but that there's a coordinated effort going on behind the scenes that it's time to gently shove corn pops and nemesis off the stage in time for the 2024 election. Again, sounds conspiratorial, but, you know, David Ignatius wrote a column in the Washington Post saying, thank you, Joe Biden, but it's time to move on. And he's generally considered the voice of the Beltway, the insider speaking aloud via the Washington Post. So, you know, when you have columns like that, it doesn't just happen in a vacuum. It does mean something. Now, if all this is happening, if there is sort of a gentle pressure, a push to get Biden off the stage in time to swap outs for someone else to face off against, I'd imagine, Donald Trump, I think SNL might hammer Biden's decline. I mean, they may not be able to resist at this point. If they have the all clear sign, why would you not tell those jokes? And if that happens, it'll be the biggest sign that there is a genuine effort to make, make sure that Biden just steps, steps away from the stage and lets someone else take over. And none of this is guaranteed. I mean, SNL has been ignoring Biden for two years now. And they don't even dare mention Vice President Kamala Harris's name. My gosh, you can't do that. But I think there's a small window, a small chance that Saturday Night Live may reclaim its old glory, tell the jokes that you need to tell, make us laugh, and also make us think about, my gosh, why do we put this elderly man in the White House? Well, that's it for the show this week. Thank you to Radio America for having me as part of their great podcast lineup. And again, I hope you'll check out HollywoodInToto.com updated seven days a week. I've got news, reviews, commentary, all in the crazy things that are happening in Hollywood when it's closed for renovations or even when the strikes finally settle. And I think we're finally heading to that place we can say action once more. See you next time.